Good morning. Oh, it's a little hot. <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad I have a sound person back there that can help. Well, we got Rick awake. All right, we'll try that again. Good morning. Good morning. All right, there we go. It is great to be here and to see you all this morning. Um, the very end of October, well, I guess tomorrow is officially the end, but uh, we're at the end of October. I can hardly believe it. Uh, a few announcements as we get started this morning. Um, first of all, again, welcome to those of you who are here. Uh, welcome to those of you joining us on Facebook Live. It is good to have you joining us as well. Uh, we have Sunday School that meets at 945 in the back corner classroom. Uh, today we just finished up our study on the book of Colossians. And next week we will begin a new study on the Ten Commandments. So we'd love to have you join us for that. Um, men, our men's group is not meeting this Friday, November 4th, uh, but we will resume meeting on Friday, November 11th at Joe DeLeon's house from 8 to 9. Uh, we'll be reading and discussing Matthew chapter 24. It's a biggie, so you might want to read it this week and read it again next week um, for the discussion of that. Um, also, uh, there is no prayer meeting this Wednesday, um, and so if you... Uh, show up for that. Well, you're welcome to show up for that and, and pray. I won't be here this Wednesday is what I should say. Uh, but you're welcome to pray anytime, not just Wednesdays. <laughs> um, a reminder that we have a very short business meeting next Sunday, November 6th, uh, right after church. We're not going to do a full business meeting with all of the reports. The purpose of this business meeting is to adopt the updated and revised church constitution and bylaws. Uh, if you haven't yet received a copy and want one, there should be more in the back there that you can pick up. Um, I need any suggested changes, if you have them, by midnight tonight, because <laughs> I need time to process them, them um, before next Sunday. Uh, so, But you can take that and read that. Um, also, just a reminder that there is a bonfire without the fire, correct? We'll see. Okay. Well, there's a bonfire. Well, uh, there's a fall gathering. There may or there may not be a fire, but there's a fall gathering at the Lusk's new home today at 4 p.m. Um, and so it, there are directions in the back. Um, you can also talk to Cynthia about how to get there if you need, but... Uh, uh, join for that at 4 o'clock today. Um, I also want to uh, invite Kathy Taylor. She has an announcement about our upcoming potluck. I think everybody can hear me. <laughs> can you hear me back there? Um, okay, as you may or may not know, the 13th of November will be our church potluck, Thanksgiving potluck. The church will provide the turkey, but I have a little sign-up that I need all the rest of you to help us out with. So um, there's a sign-up for mashed potatoes, dressing, rolls, salads, desserts, and gravy and if you sign up to bring gravy like three just three of those packages of instant gravy so um and you can bring them next sunday whatever and we'll put it in the back the other thing kathy has asked me to remind you that if you know of a family who needs a thanksgiving basket she needs to know by next sunday the sixth okay I will start this around. Anybody have any questions? Good. <laughs> All right. Uh, just a few more things. Um, a reminder, next week, next Sunday, not only do we have the business meeting, but we have our time change. So don't forget to change your clocks. Uh, if you want, you know, hang this bulletin up by your calendar because it's written in there in the bulletin that the time changes next week. Uh, we also have the last for 2022 Labor of Love on November 12th. That's on Saturday, 9 a.m. Uh, we meet at Pioneer Park. And then just so there's a heads up, 
the last day to bring your boxes for Operation Christmas Child is November 20th. Um, and if you need a box, we've got boxes in the back. Uh, the ones that are already folded and filled, uh, don't take those. <laughs> those are uh, returned ones, uh, but that's available. And then finally, today is the fifth Sunday of the month, and on our fifth Sundays, uh, we do a benevolence offering. And a benevolence offering, again, is for those either in our congregation or in our community that are in need. And so you'll find underneath the big bulletin board, and it has a little sign in it that says benevolence offering. There's the uh, benevolence offering plate there, and then our regular offering plate is before you go out the door. And so that's what is happening. So again, welcome. It's great to be with you. And if you would all stand now, uh, we hold will on, join. Hold on, oh. hold on. This being the last Sunday of Pastor Appreciation Month, so this is uh, a card for Ryan and Christiana. I'm not going to tell you how much, but you better look. Okay. <laughs> anyway, we thank you guys. We thank your family for being such a wonderful addition and part of our church. Thank you. Thank you. So now if you'll stand, we will join in worship singing. So we're going to start with a song that goes, I lift my eyes up to the Lord. And Rick and I this week have really had to lift our eyes up to the Lord and trust in Him.
And now we will have our children's sermon. Good morning. Morning. Good job. Good job. So let's say it again. Good morning. Good morning. There we go. Good morning online. I know that you at home said good morning back. We just know that you did. Uh, this morning's Bible verse is uh, 1 Timothy 4.12. It's one of Pastor Ryan's favorite verses. Should you stand up and recite it? No. Just kidding. I won't make him do that. Okay. Just teasing. Okay. So 1 Timothy, he probably could do it. 1 Timothy 4.12. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Okay. So can you hold that for me, babe? Hey, kids. Do you guys know what this is? Here, I'll show you online so you can see. What is this? Truly, well, you don't have to raise your hand. You could just shout out. It's not school. Roller coaster, roller coaster right? Have you guys ever been on a roller coaster before? Yeah. No. Hey, Grown-ups, have you ever been on a roller coaster before? Yeah. Yes. Have you guys been on a roller coaster before? So um, when you get on a roller coaster at an amusement park, or maybe kids, have you been to the fair? Did you go to the yeah. fair? Yes, the fair. Okay. And when you go to the fair, you get in line, right? And then you have to, like, stand in line, and then there's usually some kind of measurement tool to see if you're tall enough to get on the ride, right? And to see if you can ride it. Have you ever been in line and then you can't get on because you're not tall enough? Or walked by because you're not tall enough? No, you did not go to the fair short enough. Because, <laughs> because there are always these measuring sticks, right? That you have to stand up and see, are you tall enough? And if you're tall enough, that means you can ride the ride and it's for safety, right? Well, guess, the, guess what the good news is, kids? There is not a re height requirement for following Jesus, right? You can get on that ride right now. <laughs> and you don't have to be tall enough or old enough or strong enough or smart enough to follow Jesus, right? There's, there's no way we could be enough to accept Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, right? Like you just can get on. You can just ask Jesus into your heart. And then when you ask Jesus into your heart, do you guys know what he sends you? Right, Talia? He sends you the Holy Spirit, right? And so then the Bible first says, let me read it again. Oops, it got closed. Hold on. It says, don't let anybody look down on you. Don't let anybody think you're too young or too short because you are young. But set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct. So the way you talk, the way you behave, how you love other people, um, and how, just generally following Jesus. And the Holy Spirit will feel, not only fill you up, but he will... You will be an example to the other people around you. They will be able to see Jesus through you. There's no height requirement for the Holy Spirit. He's just doing his thing in your life. And people will be encouraged in their faith through you, no matter how old or how young you are. Isn't that pretty cool? Mm -hmm. That you can be young and you can shine for Jesus. So don't think to yourself, oh, I'm just kind of little. I'm not very old. Or maybe I'll do that when I'll grow up. I'll just wait. I'll just wait till I grow up. No, no, no. Right now, today... Let the Holy Spirit shine through you, love on the people around you. I cannot tell you how many times, maybe Talia and Silas and Angela you, and Brent, you guys could, or, oh, all the bakers, maybe you, all of them were my class. How many times were we in Bible and you asked a question and it blessed everybody else, right? Right now, today, no height requirement, you're old enough, right now, this moment. Okay, back there too, LJ and Songland, I didn't leave, sorry I left you out. You're, you're old enough right now. Matt, you're old enough right now to just have ashes in your heart and let his Holy Spirit fill you up and then be an example to all the other people, no matter how old you are. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you. We praise you that there's no height requirement, that we could just, no matter where we're at, no matter what's going on with our lives, that we could just ask you to come in and, and fill us with your spirit. You will forgive us of our sins, uh, make us a new creation in you, and that we can grow and change the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's not something, thank you so much, it's not something we get when we're 12 or 15 or 45. It's something that we get when we ask you in our hearts. And we just thank you for the spirit that you give us, that it's full of power and love and self-control. In your name we pray, amen. Now is the time that we have for congregational prayer. And I want to encourage you and invite you, uh, if you feel comfortable doing so during this time, to say a prayer out loud, a prayer of request, a prayer of thanks. Uh, and if you don't feel comfortable praying out loud, 
that's no problem. I want to invite you to pray silently with us. And maybe you're here this morning and you feel like, I just don't know how to pray or I don't know what to pray or I'm just struggling with prayer. Again, no problem. Because scripture tells us that the Spirit will pray on your behalf. And so let's go before God in prayer now. Lord, we do praise you and thank you for this morning. And again, for just your many, many blessings. Lord, you bless us in so many ways. And um, we even talked in Sunday school this morning about all the little things that you do that so often I know I just, uh, I, I don't even recognize. I take for granted. But Lord, you are faithful that even when I don't recognize it and take it for granted, you are faithful to continue to bless us, to bless me because we are your children through Jesus Christ. Lord, and we praise you and thank you for that, that, that again, as your adopted children, you invite us to come directly to you with our prayers, to come to you and lay them before us, before you, before your feet, lay them into your hands. And Lord, again, we know that you are faithful to answer our prayers. Sometimes that answer is yes. Sometimes the answer is no, and sometimes the answer is wait. But Lord, you are faithful to answer, and we praise you and thank you for that. And Lord, we do in our prayers reflect back to how Jesus taught us, taught the disciples and taught us to pray, Lord. And we do pray that you would help us to align our will with your will instead of the reverse of trying to mold you or make you to align your will with ours and so lord we uh, do pray that as well lord again we are privileged as a body to come before you and so lord hear us as we pray together as a congregation now
before you this morning. And uh, just ask that you'll give Linda and I strength and most of all direction on uh, how to just move forward day by day. Just have your hand upon everything we say and do. And for our kids and grandkids. Lord again, Lord, again, we thank you for this chance to be together, to fellowship with one another, to come to praise you. Lord, we do pray that you would open our ears and our hearts and our minds to hear from you this morning what it is that you want to teach us. And Lord, in all that we do, in all that we are, both individually as well as as a congregation, may you be glorified. And we lift all these things to you, Lord, now in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, children, you are dismissed to Children's Church. And as they're heading out, we will have our scripture reading. Our scripture reading this morning is from Psalms 40, 8 through 10. I desire to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. I proclaim righteousness in the great assembly. I do not seal my lips, as you know, O Lord. I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and salvation. I do not conceal your love and your truth from the great assembly. Let's join together in prayer. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Amen. So as we stand together and sing, Be Thou My Vision. So this really has become a prayer of my heart this week, especially the second verse. Be Thou My Wisdom and Thou My Truth.
want to invite you and encourage you to open your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 10. And today we're going to be looking at verses 25 through 37. And if you don't have your Bible with you, there's one right there in the pew. And the title of today's sermon is Leaving a Trace of Grace. So follow along with me as I read this morning's passage, starting in Luke chapter 10, verse 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? Jesus replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied, do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. <laughs> then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Well, several years ago, Hugh Rudd, a CBS anchorman and reporter, was mugged just outside his New York City apartment complex. He was beaten and knocked down, but he remained conscious with his eyes open. However, he was unable to move. He was right next to his doorstep, but all he could do was moan. Hours later, after being rescued, he recounted the frightening scene as he lay there, watching people walk past him in the darkness, ignoring his moans for help. He said that even the milkman came early that morning, set the milk, down, the milk cans down next to him, and walked away. No one stopped to see what was wrong until later that morning. And I've read, actually, in recent days that even 911 professionals who have been trained to respond to people who call in for help are not always willing to help. Now, before I give a couple examples, I want to make it clear. This is not the norm. This is the rarity. <laughs> so I don't want you to think that I'm saying, oh, 911 operators are not helpful at all. No, no, no. But there are some times where it is kind of shocking, the lack of help, even from those who are trained to do it. In fact, I read one news report of a woman hiding in a store as an active shooter was on the rampage. And she dialed 911 and whispered for help. Well, apparently the operator scolded the woman for whispering and then hung up on her. Uh, another 911 operator received a call from a terrified woman whose car was stalled in a flooded road, and it was filling up with water. It had all happened so suddenly that she was afraid to open the door or the window. So she called to ask for a rescue and for advice on what to do in the meantime. Well, instead of sending help, the operator began lecturing her on the foolishness of driving in that storm saying that the woman should have known better. And this 911 operator lectured on until the line went dead and the woman had drowned. 
And it is true that these do happen more than we would like to. In fact, legislators and lawmakers have struggled with this issue of human responsibility, trying to determine when and how people should be willing to help others. In fact, every single state in our country today has created what they officially call the Good Samaritan Laws. And it's a fascinating concept behind these laws. And one thing that's fascinating is that these laws come from this conversation that Jesus had with a lawyer. And I want to listen, I want all of us to listen in on this conversation in Luke 10 even more closely. Because this encounter should have a direct bearing on our attitude even to this day. And so let's take a closer look at this passage together, starting back in verse 25, Luke 10, 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, Jesus very well could have embarrassed this man by responding in such a way like, you're a lawyer. You should know that you do not do anything to receive an inheritance. Somebody died, you're alive. The person who died left something. You didn't earn it, you just receive it. So sign here and have a good day. But this was not a legal question. This was actually a theological question. Dwight Pentecost writes that what this lawyer is really asking is, how good do I have to be in order to get into the Messiah's kingdom and receive eternal life. Eternal life and the kingdom were one and the same. So asking, what do I have to do, is the same thing as asking, how good do I have to be to get in? And this lawyer is probably expecting Jesus to give him the standard set of rules. You know, follow the traditions of your fathers, obey rabbinical teaching, and observe the Jewish ordinances and Sabbaths and ceremonies. He, he wants to know how many rules he has to keep in order to get into the kingdom. So Jesus actually gives him a pop quiz here in verse 26. What is written in the law? Jesus replied. How do you read it? Now, this is an open book quiz. Essentially, what does the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, say about what makes a person right with God? And how do you interpret it? In other words, what does it look like in real life? Now, this was an easy quiz for the lawyer because he already had the answer memorized. In fact, he prayed the answer every morning and every evening like any good Jewish man would have done. It's written here in Luke 10, 27, but it comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 27. He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. One pause there for just a moment. Because the Jewish world at that time believed, just as we do today, that the heart was, at the, was the center of of emotions and desire that the soul was the center of consciousness and personality that strength was the place of will and determination and that the mind was the center of intelligence and cognition and so the greatest commandment in the law was not a rule it was a relationship it means love God with everything that you are. But then the lawyer goes one step further and adds another passage found in Leviticus 19.18. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says in verse 28, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Now, it's one thing to quote scripture, but it's another thing to apply scripture and now here's the catch if jesus had asked the man do you love god with all your heart the man could have said 
Of course I do. And what could you say to that? This lawyer could have easily responded that he loves God. And since he's dedicated his life to studying the law of God, everybody in the room would have vouched for him. End of discussion. The trouble is that he added that part about loving your neighbor as yourself. That's tangible. That's physical evidence that you can bring into the courtroom. Jesus could go and knock on this man's neighbor's doors and find out all about this. And it's one thing to say you love God, but it's another thing to demonstrate it by loving other people. And he's probably standing there thinking, why in the world did he have to add that part about loving my neighbor? <laughs> and what the lawyer does next is look for a loophole. And it's a clever one. Verse 29. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? He knows he's in trouble. He knows the evidence won't be helpful. So he stalls for time, and he asks Jesus, for Jesus' definition of a neighbor. <clears throat> now, for some of us, that might sound ridiculous that he's asking for that. But it's helpful to know that by the time of Christ, many of the Jewish rabbis had defined a man's neighbor as another follower of God. So he's hoping that Jesus would agree with that definition and, and say something like, well, just as the rabbis have taught for centuries, your neighbor is someone who goes to the synagogue with you, who lives on the same side of the railroad tracks as you do, who looks like you, who votes like you, who likes you, who likes everybody and everything the same way that you do. And with that, the lawyer could say, I'm doing that. I've got a train load of witnesses in the community who will vouch for me. Which effectively says nothing more than, I love people who love me. And I'm loving towards people who are loving toward me. That actually is the standard rule of thumb in this day for many. One famous rabbi born 190 years before the birth of Christ taught in his best-selling volume, and I quote, If you do good, know to whom you do it. Give to the devout, but do not help the sinner. Hold back their bread, and do not give it to them. Give to the one who is good. In other words, love your friends because they qualify as your neighbors. And then you essentially get to be hateful to everybody else. That's what this rabbi stated but Jesus does not buy into the same status quo instead he begins to tell a story that will radically redefine the definition of a neighbor and what love truly looks like he starts in verse 30 in reply Jesus said a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers they stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now, everyone listening to Jesus would have immediately resonated with this scene because this type of story was in their newspapers every other day. This road from Jerusalem to Jericho was about 17 miles long. It was rough and a rocky thoroughfare, winding through areas where caves dotted the hillside, creating perfect hideouts for bandits. In fact, Josephus, the first century historian, Jewish historian, wrote that bandits were out there robbing travelers 400 years before the time of Christ. It had long been since a popular route for bandits to rob people. In more recent times, not more recent to us, but more, in more recent times, to Jesus, King Herod had rebuilt Jericho and turned it into a resort. 
He had three of his own palaces there, complete with swimming pools and gardens. And VIPs traveled this road, as well as government officials, religious leaders, and wealthy upper-class people heading for a weekend at the resort. So this was the perfect place to hijack a caravan of rich people. In fact, so many people were robbed and injured or killed on this stretch of road that by the time of Jesus telling this story, the road had already been nicknamed the Bloody Road. And so people listening to Jesus describe this man who'd been nearly beaten to death and robbed would have been shaking their heads and saying, yeah, we know, we know what you're talking about. And Jesus says in verse 31, a priest happened to be going down the same road. That is, in the same direction. And the crowd around Jesus most likely brightened up thinking, oh, how great is that? This man represented the height of devotion to God. He was considered the servant of God, a man who ministered in the temple of God. Oh, how fortunate is this? The timing was perfect. Here comes help. But Jesus continues. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. <laughs> well, that was unexpected. If anybody is supposed to be good enough to get into the kingdom, it's a member of the professional priesthood. But he passed by on the other side. Literally, he changed lanes. Why? Well, we're not told exactly, but here's a clue. Numbers 19.11 informs us that during these Old Testament times, and let me clarify, you might be saying, wait, but I thought we're in the New Testament, Luke's New Testament. Yes, but Christ has not been crucified and raised again, so we're still in the, New, uh, the Old Testament times in terms of the, the expectations and requirements. During these Old Testament times, anyone who came in contact with a dead body would be automatically unclean for seven days. To this priest, the beaten man probably looked dead. It does say that he was half dead. He probably looked dead, and the priest is probably thinking, there's no need to check for a pulse and then have to quarantine for seven days. We all know what a pain it is to quarantine. Yeah. No one wants to volunteer for that. Yeah. And Bible scholars point out the fact that since Jericho had the largest population of priests living outside of Jerusalem during the days of Christ, this priest was more than likely returning home after having served his tour of duty in the temple. He's tired. He wants to get home. He's just returning from serving God. To put it in a New Testament context, he was on his way home from church. He had just sung the hymns of the faith and worshipped with the saints. He may have even preached twice that morning. He wants to get home, eat lunch, and take a nap. The thing is, you don't make appointments in your calendar to be a good Samaritan. You don't schedule convenient times for helping people with their problems. You just show up. This priest surely had this Bible verse memorized, but he was not about to put it into practice. Maybe he thought to himself that he would just leave the task to one of the temple assistants, the Levite. Perhaps he knew that there was also a Levite traveling home a short distance behind him. Well, look at verse 32. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed on the other side. He changed lanes as well. The audience was still shocked that the priest didn't help, and they definitely expected the Levite to help. Levites served as temple assistants. They had calloused hands, meaning they got dirty and messy. They were built for this sort of thing. So surely the Levite will help this blood-caked, beaten, 
naked man and not just leave him out there to die. The language here gives the sense that he went up closer to the man to look at him more carefully. It's implied that he stood there for a moment or two deciding what to do next. And again, we are not told why he walked away. However, let's make sure that we don't point fingers too quickly. Let's not downplay the danger. It's possible that thieves were nearby. They might even be waiting for their next victim. I have no doubt that this Levite was looking over his shoulder for any sign of danger, maybe even thinking this might be a trap. And for whatever reason, he decided it wasn't worth the effort or the risk. I want to share this with you. The amazing thing in this story is not that the priest and the Levite did not stop to help. After all, this was a dangerous road. This was the wrong part of town. This was not the place to pull over. So let's not be too hard on the priest and the Levite. It's going to take somebody unusually kind to stop and help. And the more that I think about this narrative, the surprising thing here, again, is not that these two men did not stop to help. The surprising thing is that somebody did. Look at verse 33 and the beginning of verse 34 with me. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn. One author commented that Jesus' audience would have expected the Samaritan to actually finish off what the robbers had started. And the implication of the story is that this beaten man is a Jew. And the Jews and the Samaritans hated one another. And the hatred had grown over several centuries. Well, this parable is about to take an unexpected turn of events. Notice again that this Samaritan's compassion is comprehensive. First, he bandaged his wounds, probably using strips of cloth from his own turban or tunic. Then he poured wine on his wounds. This would be to disinfect the wounds. And then oil to relieve the pain. By the way, Jews never purchased or received oil or wine from a Samaritan. It was considered unclean. Then it says, he put the man on his own donkey, implying that the Samaritan now walked instead. And he took him to an end. At this point, most people think the Samaritan paid the innkeeper to take care uh, of the, I'm sorry, that, that, yeah, that the Samaritan paid this innkeeper to take care of the injured man and then took off. But that isn't what happened when we look at scripture. Notice the end of verse 34 and the beginning of 35. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day... Let's pause there for a moment. That means he took care of him. The Samaritan took care of this injured man through the night at the most critical stage in this man's condition. He didn't hand him off, but rather he stayed with him. And then the next day, verse 35, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Again, understanding the, the context of this helps, at least for me, because when I first read this, it's easy for me to kind of just breeze by. He took out two silver coins, you know, what, two quarters? Yeah, I mean, like, my brain doesn't necessarily register what that meant. But he gave the innkeeper enough money to cover 
the expenses. In fact, historians believe that these two silver coins would have covered this man's room and board for nearly one month. Not just a day, not just a couple days, but for nearly one month. Nobody does that. And the point here is that somebody who truly knows God and loves God should be the one who does this type of thing. It's important to understand here that Jesus is not defining the plan of salvation. He is not saying that if you want to go to heaven, make sure you stop at every accident and help. <coughs> Just as Jesus has responded to several other individuals, he knows their hearts and he looks at that key element of hypocrisy or rebellion and he points his finger there at that. And so Jesus turns to this lawyer and asks him one more question as seen in verse 36 and 37. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. I find it interesting. He can't even bring himself to say the Samaritan. <laughs> he, he can't get those words out of his mouth in a positive context. He just can't say it. He has gotten the point, but he will not repent of his prejudice, his pride, his partiality. And he, can, he will continue claiming to love God while continuing to hate the Samaritans. Well, as I studied this parable for this week, the Good Samaritan is presented as a model, not for getting into the kingdom, but how to act like our king. Remember, for each and every one of us, Jesus found us helpless and hopeless, empty and broken. Jesus saw you and had compassion on you. He stopped and he stooped to pick you up. He restored your life and put you on your feet. And then he paid all the bills for your spiritual care. He has even promised to come back again to settle every account on your behalf. Everything he touches in your life leaves the evidence of love or the trace of grace. John Sutherland, an officer in London's police department, explained this principle of forensic science called Lockhart's Principle of Exchange. Developed by Dr. Edmund Lockhart, who was known as the Sherlock Holmes of Paris, or of France, not just Paris, but of all of France, this principle has a simple premise. Every contact leaves a trace. In other words, every criminal leaves a trace behind him. Wherever he steps, whatever he touches, wherever he leaves, even unconsciously, will serve as a silent witness. Not only his fingerprints and his footprints, but his hair, the fibers from his clothes, the glass he breaks, the paint he scratches, the blood he leaves behind, this is evidence that does not forget he was there. Well, Sutherland went on to explain how this principle applies not just to forensic science, but to human relationships. Every time two people come into contact with one another, an exchange takes place. Whether between lifelong friends or passing strangers, we encourage or we ignore. We hold out a hand or we withdraw it. We walk toward or we walk away. We bless or we curse. And every single contact leaves a trace. The way that we treat and regard one another matters. It leaves some kind of trace behind. And so children who belong to the king of kings should be known as those who leave behind 
the trace of grace and the evidence of mercy and love. And may we do that with every trace we meet. Amen. now receive today's benediction which comes from 2nd Corinthians chapter 13 verse 14 the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all amen